I'm hoping to get the Sanji video out sooner than it took between the Nami and Usopp videos. Sooner than it took between the Nami and Usopp videos. Sooner. Life has a funny way of sneaking up on you and distracting you from things and, you know, getting you off topic and new jobs come up and old videos sort of get forgotten about and then comments show up on them and you're like, oh, right, I should probably work on the next video. And then life gets at you. And uh, what I'm trying to say is I am very sorry that this took as long as it did because the Usopp video came out over a year ago. <laughs> and... I should have been working on this much sooner, considering these are the videos that people actually watch the most on this channel. <laughs> so, let's talk about cooking. Cooking is an interesting aspect of D&D &D that a lot of people don't think about. People ignore it sometimes. You know, your party, your party is adventuring, and they stop to eat, and maybe, like, you'll have them do a foraging check, or you'll have them, you know kill a deer and cook its meat. By the time they reach level five, level six, they get access to spells or abilities that pretty much just ignore the need for food. However, on the high seas, a cook is extremely important. And in an adventurous world like One Piece, a cook who can defend himself is even more important. So let's start talking about the chef of the Straw Hat crew. Vinsmoke Sanji. We're going to start with the ability scores this time. I neglected to mention them at the start of the Usopp video, so I feel like I feel like it's better off to just say what I'm going to do with the Sanji video at the start. Uh, the plan is to get his ability scores kind of close to each other, but to start off, we're going to have a strength score of 13, a dexterity score of 15, your constitution will be 10, intelligence 8, Wisdom 12, and Charisma 14. This is not to say that Intelligence is Sanji's dump stat. In fact, most of our ability score improvements are going to just be raising this up to bring it to where the other stats are. You could do this with Wisdom, you could do this with Constitution, you could even do this with Strength if you really wanted to, but because of how Standard Array works, I had to dump it somewhere, and I was going to boost it anyways later. As for race, we're going to go with Tiefling for Sanji. At first, I was going to go with Azimar, just because they have the wings and the Holy Nova around them, kind of symbolizing Sanji's, you know, warm, fiery energy. And then I remembered that Tieflings have resistance to fire damage. And as a cook, Sanji is very used to the heat of the kitchen. Furthermore, Sanji gets Hellish Rebuke, which allows him to reciprocate any damage he receives with his own fiery retaliation. This is good because this reflects Diablo Jambe. Even when an opponent successfully grabs him, the leg is still aflame, so he's still able to hurt his opponents with it. You can attribute his dark vision to Observation Hockey, and as for the Darkness spell, it's not really super appropriate here, but maybe you could use it as an argument for his stealth black powers? Finally, we also get Thaumaturgy, which, if you've watched enough anime, if you've seen enough manga, uh, you know this could just be for little flavorful effects, like when Sanji gets that aura around him when he's excited, or you can have the sparkles or the hearts in his eyes. Heck, you could even use Thaumaturgy to mimic the nosebleeds he gets if you're, you know, getting that much into character. Our ability score improvements are 1 in Intelligence and 2 in Charisma. Uh, intelligence is, well, I just thought that's where I would dump the Intelligence stat, that way we can help build it up a little further. And Charisma, well, Sanji's a really charming guy, so this actually worked really well picking a Tiefling. If you're so inclined, you can go with Tasha's Cauldron and just put the stats wherever you want, because of that new rule that was introduced in that book, but I feel like for, for these videos, it takes away the challenge if I'm able to just pick and choose whatever I want. So I'll be sticking to the raw resource when it comes to where my stats are coming from. As I say in every video, you could make your own custom background with the help of your DM deciding what proficiencies and abilities you want to obtain, but 
For Sanji, I would strongly recommend Guild Artisan, representing his time on the Baratier. Guild Artisan gives us two proficiencies, one in Insight and one in Persuasion. Insight is pretty good for Sanji. He's a guy that can usually see through lies or any kind of illusions. For example, he knew exactly what kind of guy he was fighting when he ran into Absalom. As for persuasion, well, I think you've seen Sanji and you know that he is a very persuasive guy. Plus, when your captain is Monkey D. Luffy, you have to find some way to keep him away from that fridge. In addition to this, we get a tool proficiency of our choice, and we will be choosing, obviously, Cook's Utensils. As always, the language we receive from this background is completely irrelevant. In fact, we did get some languages as a tiefling, but again, not really relevant. Everyone speaks the same language in the world of One Piece, and the one language that is another language is completely written, and we've never heard a spoken word of it. In addition to our artisan's tools, we also get a letter of introduction from our guild. You could flavor this as a maybe a menu from the Baratier, or Zeph's recommendation letter, if Zeph was the kind of guy to write those. I will admit that I did think about um, using the Noble as the background, but the more I looked at it, the Noble really doesn't provide anything that Sanji does, and it feels like it feels like the noble background doesn't fit the character of Sanji, which is amazingly appropriate considering being a noble never suited Sanji even as a kid. Finally, because we have access to everything within these books, we are going to be picking some magic items to go with Sanji. For our attunement slots, we're going to be picking the Cloak of Invisibility, which suits the raid suit that Sanji has very well. The Bracers of Defense, just to give Sanji a little extra um, buffness to protect himself with. And finally, the Winged Boots, which will allow us for a temporary amount of time to fly, kind of similar to Sanji's ability to use Skywalk. As for our unattuned items, we're going to be going with the Alchemy Jug, which has a surprisingly large amount of contents that are useful for a cook, including mayonnaise. I, I really, to this day, I still don't know why the Alchemy Jug has mayonnaise, but it became useful here. So, congrats, Wizards of the Coast. You foresaw the future and knew that a guy was going to build Sanji from One Piece and would definitely want mayonnaise. We're also going to take a suit of adamantine armor to represent the raid suit that Sanji has only worn a couple times, but it's something we can don and doff as needed. We also are going to take the Necklace of Adaptation, because Sanji is used to smoke, given the fact that he's the only member of the crew that is constantly smoking. And Ascending Stone, which is going to represent the Den Den Mushi. Uh, I'm pretty sure for the rest of these builds, as I get to them, uh, I'm going to give them Ascending Stone to represent a Transponder Snail, just for each and every member of the crew. Uh, you could even retcon my previous four builds to give them Transponder Snails as well. The only other um, items I could really think of for the attunement slots that I thought were appropriate were the Ring of Invisibility, which is just like the cloak but not as cool, and the Ring of Jumping, which is, you know, Sanji can jump really high, but when you have the winged boots, is it really useful? So we've set our ability scores, we've picked our race, we got our background, we have some magic items, it is finally time to get into our very first level, Monk because Sanji, much like his captain, fights unarmed. For this full build, we're going to be using the Player's Handbook. Uh, we have our items from the Dungeon Master's Guide. We're going to be using Xanathar's Guide to Everything for one subclass feature, and we are going to be taking only two feats from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. So if you don't have access to that book, feel free to put in some other feats instead or ability score improvements where appropriate. A monk allows us to start off with saving throws in dexterity, which is pretty appropriate for Sanji being the kind of dexterous fighter that he is, and strength because Sanji, much like most anime characters, is really, really strong. The skills we'll be taking from the monk class will be acrobatics and athletics which are obviously from the training Zeph would have given Sanji over the years, in the black leg style. Our starting equipment consists of a simple weapon, which we will be using as a knife for our kitchen knife, 
an explorer's pack, which contains a tinder box, 10 days of rations, and a water skin, all appropriate things for a cook. The rest of the things in the explorer's pack are kind of irrelevant. They'll come up as needed, but probably not really relevant to being Sanji. And finally, 10 darts. Also not important. Sanji's not really a ranged weapon guy. You could flavor it as maybe like kitchen knives that Sanji would throw at people, but Sanji, again, doesn't believe in using cooking utensils as actual weapons. So it's best to just sort of throw those to the wayside, maybe give them to Usopp. Also at level 1, we get Unarmored Defense, which adds our Wisdom to our Armor class when we have no armor or shields. This is why I didn't want to dump Wisdom as opposed to Intelligence, because starting at level 1, before we get all our Ability Score improvements, we're going to be needing that extra Armor Defense because we aren't wearing anything. What's more, Sanji doesn't wear armor, he wears a suit. Although you can count the raid suit, which is why we have the mithril armor. And finally, the most obvious part of being a monk, martial arts. Sanji's kicks are unarmed attacks, skilled at hitting multiple times in a span of a few seconds. With martial arts, we gain the following benefits while we are unarmed or wielding only monk weapons and aren't wearing armor or wielding a shield. We can use our dexterity instead of strength for the attack and damage rolls of our unarmed strikes and monk weapons. We can also roll a d4 in place of the normal damage of our unarmed strike or monk weapon. This die will change as we gain monk levels, as shown in the martial arts column on the monk table. And when we use an attack action with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon on our turn, we can make one unarmed strike as a bonus action. This means that even at level 1, we'll be able to attack multiple times in a single turn, which is very appropriate considering even as the Straw Hats first met Sanji, he was already kicking tables and smacking dudes multiple times in a single turn. At level 2, we gain the ability to use Ki, which is kind of similar to Chakra, but well, we won't get into the Naruto versus One Piece debate here. <laughs> Instead, we'll be talking about what Ki actually gives us and how it relates to Sanji. Starting off, Flurry of Blows actually gives us another attack, in addition to the one attack we already got as an extra bonus action. Though it does cost us a key point to do so, this allows us at level 2 to have 3 attacks in a single turn. We also gain Patient Defense, which allows us to spend a key point in order to take the dodge action as a bonus action. Sanji has specialized in observation hockey, so being able to dodge as a bonus action is very appropriate to him seeing attacks coming and whiffing out of the way. Finally, using a key point, we can use a bonus action to dash, allowing us to move twice as fast during our turn. As stated by Oda himself, Sanji is the second fastest straw hat next to Brook, so being able to dash as a bonus action is very appropriate. Speaking of moving fast, at level 2 we also get Unarmored Movement, which allows us to increase our movement speed by 10 feet while we're not wearing armor or wielding a shield. This bonus increases as we gain levels in Monk. So by the end of our last Monk level I will let you know how many bonuses we actually have. Our next level will also be in Monk, and this is going to continue on for a while. At third level we gain Deflect Missiles, which allows us to catch the missile when we are hit by a ranged weapon attack. When we do that, the damage we take from the attack is reduced by 1d10 plus the dexterity modifier plus our monk level. If we reduce the damage to zero, we can catch the missile if it is small enough for us to hold in a hand, and we have at least one hand free. If we catch the missile in this way, we can spend an additional key point to make a ranged attack with the weapon or piece of ammunition that we caught as part of the same reaction. We have seen Sanji deflect cannonballs. It's pretty easy to think that a simple arrow would be something Sanji could handle. Granted, it's not having one hand free, but you could discuss with your DM the flavor of using your foot rather than using your hand to catch and throw. Either way, your hands are going to be free anyways because Sanji doesn't believe in using weapons. More importantly, at level 3, we get to pick our monk tradition. And for Sanji, we're going to be picking the Way of the Four Elements. When we choose this tradition at level 3, we learn magical disciplines that harness the power of the four elements. A discipline requires you to spend key points each time we use it. We get to take two of the elemental disciplines at the start of our level 3, and the ones we'll be taking are elemental attunement, which we have to take, 
Uh, this will allow us to create a harmless, instantaneous sensory effect related to one of the four elements, such as sparks or wind or rumbling stone. Again, you can just attune this to uh, anime effects as they're going off. But the interesting thing we have here is we can chill or warm up to one pound of non-living material for up to an hour. It's a good little cooking tool to, just to have Sanji basically reheat your food. Or you could have it as like his uh, flaming leg from Diablo Jambe. He just sort of like holds it and then like puts the food on top of it to heat it back up. The other elemental discipline we're going to be taking is Fangs of the Fire Snake. When we use the attack action on our turn, we can spend one key point to cause tendrils of flame to stretch out from our fists and feet. Our reach with our unarmed strikes increases by 10 feet for that action, as well as the rest of the turn. A hit with such an attack deals fire damage instead of bludgeoning damage, and if you spend one key point when the attack hits, it also deals an extra 1d10 fire damage. So, obviously, this is a representation of Diablo Jambe, which allows Sanji to deal fire damage on his opponents whenever he kicks them. Uh, the extra range of 10 feet is kind of more of a Bon Clay thing when it comes to kicking, so maybe try to avoid doing that if you're trying to stay in character, but the extra range isn't too bad if you're just going for mid-maxing with a slight Sanji flavor to it. The fourth level of Monk grants you an ability score improvement, but instead we're going to be taking a feat found in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, the Chef Feat. Time spent mastering the culinary arts has paid off, granting you the following benefits. Increase your constitution or wisdom score by one, which we will be using on our constitution score. You gain proficiency with cook's utensils if you don't already have it. As part of a short rest, you can cook special food, provided you have ingredients and cook's utensils on hand. You can prepare enough of this food for a number of creatures equal to four plus your proficiency bonus. The Straw Hat crew consists of 10 people right now, so it's actually really helpful because by the time you reach level 20, your proficiency bonus will be a plus 6. Give it 4, so 10 total, you can actually feed the entire crew with this ability. At the end of the short rest, any creature who eats the food and spends 1 or more hit dice to regain hit points regains an extra 1d8 hit points. Also. With one hour of work, or when you finish a long rest, you can cook a number of treats equal to your proficiency bonus. These special treats last eight hours after being made. A creature can use a bonus action to eat one of these treats to gain temporary hit points equal to your proficiency bonus. Now granted, that only maxes out at an extra six points, and the people eating your treats are probably going to be Luffy or Zoro or, you know, frontline fighters, but it's still nice to have, and it's definitely appropriate. I mean, how many times have we seen Luffy just pull out a random piece of food and start munching on it? So it, it's nice to know that Sanji can pack a lunch to his crewmen and send them off into battle. When a lot of melee classes hit level 5, they gain the ability Extra Attack. Monk is no different, and with this, Sanji now has the ability to strike four times in a single turn. But in addition to that, at level 5, Monks get the ability Stunning Strike. This allows a monk to strike their opponent for a little bit of extra oomph using their key points. Then the enemy has to make a constitution saving throw, and if they fail, they become stunned for an entire round until the end of the monk's next turn. The sixth level of monk grants us the power of Key Empowered Strikes, which just allows us to consider our monk weapons and our monk melee punches and stuff as a magical attack. In Sanji's case, this could be considered his armament hockey, allowing him to hit enemies like Logia users or, you know, strike a little harder on enemies that would normally be resistant to non-magical bludgeoning attacks. In addition to that, at level 6 we can take another elemental discipline. This one will be Sweeping Cinder Strike, which kind of works similar to Sanji's Fritz Asoritz, I believe that's how it's pronounced? ability that he used against Jabra during the Ennis Lobby arc. So the way I the reason I picked the you know Cinder Strikes is it allows us to cast Burning Hands at the cost of some of our key points depending on how many points we want to spend. What's more, it attacks in a cone, which 
if you look at it in the manga, it looks very similar to a cone-shaped attack. Our seventh level of monk grants us evasion, and if you've ever seen Sanji move, you can tell he is a pretty evasive guy. This ability grants us the ability to dodge a little bit better than other people. Uh, the way it's worded in the player's handbook says specifically, when you are subjected to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw to take only half damage, you can instead take no damage if you succeed on the saving throw and only half damage if you fail. More importantly, at our seventh level, we gain stillness of mind. We can use our action to end one effect on ourself that is causing us to be charmed or frightened. While I wouldn't say Sanji gets frightened very easily, there have been a number of fights where Sanji needs to snap himself out of it. Uh, good examples are when he was fighting against Califa during the Ennis Lobby arc, or when he was fighting against Mr. Tubon Clay when he had to sort of remind himself that that's not Nami he's fighting. A more recent example would be against Black Maria where Sanji honestly couldn't pull himself out of it, but there were moments where he had to try and remind himself that this is an enemy. For our eighth level of monk, we're going to be opening Tasha's cauldron back up and taking the feat Crusher. You are practiced in the art of crushing your enemies, granting you the following benefits. Increase your strength or constitution by one, which will be increasing our constitution. And once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals bludgeoning damage, we can move it five feet to an unoccupied space, provided the target is no more than one size larger than you. Finally, when we score a critical hit that deals bludgeoning damage to a creature, attack rolls against that creature are made with advantage until the start of your next turn. Sanji's kicks are extremely powerful, and being able to move his opponent around is kind of something Sanji specializes in. Furthermore, Sanji hitting an opponent with such a hard-hitting attack that they don't notice the world around them is extremely appropriate, and probably something we've seen a couple times in the series. The most prominent example I can think of is when Sanji hit Bluno in Iron Body so hard that the dude almost blacked out. The ninth level of Monk just improves our unarmored movement, allowing us to run on walls and on the surface of water, but Sanji can fly, so these aren't exactly super useful. And at level 10, we gain Purity of Body, which gives us the power to be immune to poisons and diseases. Again, not really super relevant, but throughout the entire series, we've never seen Sanji get sick. We've seen Sanji lose a lot of blood, but we've never actually seen Sanji, you know, get a cold. For the 11th level of Monk, however, we are going to take our last elemental discipline, Flames of the Phoenix. We can use four key points with this to cast Fireball. While you would definitely want to use Fireball as a ranged spell attack, Sanji has used powerful, fiery melee attacks against creatures like Watatsumi during the Fishman Island arc, or when he used his Beef Burst attack against Queen during the most recent chapters of the manga. Finally, for our last level in Monk, we are going to take an ability score improvement and gain one in Strength and one in Intelligence. This is just to help boost up those levels to, you know, just make everything even out for Sanji in the end. One of the fun parts about this exercise is trying to separate the lore of Dungeons & Dragons from its mechanics, and breaking down the mechanics to what suits a character more than what suits the character's archetype kind of thing. What I'm trying to get at here is finding an excuse to justify Sanji with levels in Barbarian. I know Sanji's not the most barbaric guy around, but the abilities that the Barbarian provides actually are pretty useful to Sanji. A good example is, at level 1, we gain Rage, which sort of works like armament hockey, giving us a little bit of extra protection against weaker enemies coming at us, as well as allowing us to sort of brace ourselves for the more powerful enemies striking us later on. Furthermore, this extra damage that we gain will increase our monk strikes, giving us a total of 8 damage per turn if we're using Flurry of Blows. I know that doesn't sound like a lot at later levels, but it really does add up when you consider all the critical hits Sanji's going to get, when you consider all the stunning strikes he's going to use, 
This 8 damage will add up really nicely over time, and you're, like a monk, trying to defeat your opponent through little blows at a time. Furthermore, level 1 barbarians also gain their own version of unarmored defense, although this one uses constitution rather than wisdom. It's really up to you which way you want to flavor your unarmored defense. You could say Sanji is a strong, stocky dude thanks to his years of training under Zeph, or you can say that his unarmored defense comes from his ability to dodge and his observation hockey allowing him to see attacks coming at him. We also get shields, simple, and martial weapons, but Sanji doesn't need any of those because Sanji doesn't use any of those. A level 2 barbarian gains reckless attack. When we decide to make our first attack on our turn, we can decide to attack recklessly. Doing so gives us advantage on melee weapon attack rolls using strength during this turn. Now, unfortunately, this reckless attack would not allow us to use Sanji's dexterity bonus, but rather his strength bonus. And while it's not as high in this build, you could use your ability score improvements to move it the other way. Most of the time, we're not going to go recklessly with Sanji because he's not like Zoro and Luffy. But Sanji is willing to put his life on the line, and we don't know what kind of scenarios your DM is going to throw at you. The more important thing we're getting at level 2 is Danger Sense. You have advantage on dexterity saving throws against effects that you can see, such as traps and spells. To gain this benefit, you can't be blinded, deafened, or incapacitated. You combine this with the monk's evasion, and Sanji becomes impossible to hit with things like fireball or lightning breath or surprise lasers coming out of a Brachiosaurus's long mechanical extending neck. Yeah. At third level, we gain a primal path. And just like Luffy, we're actually going to pick the path of the totem warrior. Only instead of the bear totem, we're going to be going with the eagle totem. When we're raging and aren't wearing heavy armor, other creatures have disadvantage on opportunity attack rolls against you. And we can use the dash action as a bonus action on our turn. This is good because Sanji is a kind of guy who focuses on a single opponent. Uh, a good example would be when Momonosuke was about to be executed by Kaido, Sanji weaved through an entire crowd without a single one even noticing him, much less getting an opportunity attack, and then striking it out against King. Sanji is going to gain the ability to dash as a bonus action later in this build, but I wanted to grab this eagle totem for the opportunity attacks that he'll be able to dodge. Finally, our last level in Barbarian will gain us an ability score improvement of 2 Intelligence. We're just bringing that one up. Our 17th level overall is going to be our first level in Rogue. It's very hard to play a pirate adventure without using the Rogue as a part of your build. So far, both Nami and Usopp have had the Rogue levels in their build, and Sanji is no different. When we level into Rogue, we gain Light Armor, Thieves Tools, and one skill of our choice. We'll be taking Investigation. We also get Thieves Cant, but speaking in code words isn't really something Sanji does, and language, as I've always said, is a little irrelevant in these builds due to the nature of One Piece. Starting at level 1, we gain the ability of Sneak Attack. This allows us to gain an extra d6 damage to one creature we hit with an attack if we have advantage on the attack roll. We're going to have advantage on a lot of our attack rolls thanks to Sanji constantly stunning his enemies. But you only get to use this ability once, so don't think you're going to get, you know, 4 extra d6. You're just going to get the 1. And with only 4 levels left to go, you're only going to have an extra 2d6. This is more for those surprise attacks that Sanji pulls off, like when he hit King to protect Momonosuke, or when he struck Doflamingo to protect Nami, Chopper, and Brook. Sanji is really good at ducking away from the rest of the crew and going off on his own side quests, really, to make sure things go smoothly. Also at level 1 of a rogue, we gain Expertise, which allows us to double our proficiency bonus for two of our skills. The skills we'll be picking are Investigation and Acrobatics. As I mentioned before, Sanji is known for wandering off and doing his own little side quests, looking for things that are important. 
A good example is when he wandered off and found out about what was going on with Robin, or when he accidentally heard the truth about Pudding's desire to, well, unalive him. As for acrobatics, I just thought this was really appropriate given Sanji's upbringing and his constant travels with the Straw Hats causing him to need to jump and duck and dive and dash and run and be Sanji. Unfortunately, we can't use expertise on cooking tools, otherwise that would have been the most obvious choice for Sanji. Our second level of rogue allows us a cunning action, which allows us to dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. The dash is really the only thing we're going to be using here, as it just increases Sanji's speed immensely, but the hide action could be used in tandem with our stealth black suit, and Sanji has had to avoid a couple fights here and there, such as when he had to flee from Black Maria, when he knew he wasn't going to help during that fight, or when he was running away from his trainers during the two-year time skip. I'm sure he had to disengage from many fights there. And much like a college professor asking you to buy a single book for a single paragraph in it, uh, we are going to crack open Xanathar's Guide to Everything for Sanji's roguish archetype. We'll be picking Swashbuckler, because what's a pirate adventure without at least one swashbuckler, right? At third level, when we choose this archetype, we get to learn how to land a strike and then slip away without reprisal. During our turn, if we make a melee weapon attack against a creature, that creature can't make opportunity attacks against us for the rest of our turn. Mind you, this doesn't make the eagle totem irrelevant, as the disadvantage gained on opportunity attacks does affect everyone else. It is only your specified target that cannot make opportunity attacks against you. So, Sanji could dash past all the minions, they all miss their attacks, strike the boss, and then dash back away if he needed to. The more important one we're getting here is Rakish Audacity, which not only gives a bonus to our initiative based on our Charisma modifier, but when we use Sneak Attack, we don't have to have an ally within five feet of the target, as long as the attack we're doing is melee. This further increases the chance that, that Sanji will get his sneak attack bonus when striking an enemy. Again, it's only 2d6, but when you combine it with his fire damage of an extra d10, and the two damage from being a barbarian raging, these are all little bonuses that add up together, which it's, you know, it's the little things. Our final ability score improvement that we get at level 4 of a rogue, we are going to be putting into our intelligence. I was debating putting this into Sanji's dexterity to make it extra strong, but I feel like keeping Sanji a more balanced individual is a better way of showing what Sanji can do. Whereas, you know, Luffy is extremely strong, Zoro is extremely strong, Nami, Nami is super smart, Usopp is very creative. Sanji is kind of the balanced person. He is just as smart and cunning as he is strong. By the end of the build, your character should have this many levels from these books with this as your ability scores. I would like to apologize once again for making this take so long, especially considering how many comments were asking about it. I'm happy to say that I should be more diligent on working on these. I have a new job and things are starting to look well for the channel. But if you could see any way that I could improve these videos, please let me know in the comments. That is, the goal of this year is to improve the channel by improving the quality of the videos. Thank you for watching as always, and I will see you in the next video. This is the Hero of Julios, Xing out.